On the phone with me is Rebecca Gordon. She teaches philosophy at the University of San Francisco. Uh, she is the author of Mainstreaming Torture, Ethical Approaches in the Post-9-11 United States. You can get more information at MainstreamingTorture.org. Rebecca, thanks for joining us. Delighted to do it. All right. So, and, and now I know um, uh, that uh, we're pre-taping this interview shortly after. You're going to be talking, t- uh, you're going to be, I believe, um, on the, the radio or uh, with the uh, UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights. Is that right? Or, or Almost. I'm going to be doing um, a webcast with Juan Mendez, who is actually the special rapporteur on torture for the oh. United Nations. And, well, I, so I should say that Ben Emerson, the, the special rapporteur on counterterrorism and human rights, has said uh, that there, there must be some measure of accountability here. There must be prosecutions, uh, regardless of, of whether or not, uh, the, as outlined in the, uh, the report from the, the Senate, regardless of whether or not uh, the CIA was or was not ordered uh, to uh, to engage in this torture. Give me a sense of, is this one of the potential impacts we're going to see from this report, or is this basically it? Does it just fade away? Well, I would like it to be one of the potential impacts. I was impressed to see that the BBC and some other major news outlets actually picked up that demand for prosecution because it's something that is often mentioned in more progressive or even leftist circles, but you don't usually hear it coming from official sources like the United Nations. Prosecution is not only crucial to preventing this kind of thing from happening again, but it's also a requirement, a duty that the United States has under the UN Convention Against Torture. We signed that convention in 1994, and one of the articles in it says that every state that signs it will prosecute any cases of torture that happen by their their citizens or on their territory or territory under their control. So we absolutely have a legal requirement to to prosecute. And we also have, uh, is it the uh, 96, we have federal statute as well. Is that right? Uh, uh, yes. The federal statute is a little complicated because, so not to get too technical, but when we sign, when any state signed the convention, the next thing we were supposed to do is pass what's called enabling legislation. In other words, laws at the national level that put the convention into effect in that country. The United States said, well, we already have laws against torture in the United States because it's illegal to assault someone or battery is illegal and we have a constitution. So the law that we pass is going to make it illegal to do torture outside of the United States. So the law that was passed in 96 only covers actions that happen outside the United States. Now that covers a lot of what the CIA did. So in that sense, it's covered. But The question is, does it cover, for example, Guantanamo, which is, yes, outside the United States, but under U.S. control? In any case, the U.S. has never done what the U.N. wants it to do and asked it to do again in its most recent report, which is pass a law at the federal level making torture illegal. And and, and, uh, so uh, where is is there is there any hope in, from your perspective in terms of any type of accountability, and then and break that down for me both mm-hmm. in terms of legal accountability, which I but think also is moral accountability. but also some type of moral accountability because we still we still have polls in this country which show that Americans in uh, certain circumstances um, you know say uh, torture is okay. Not only that. In fact, the willingness of Americans to do torture increased during the whole length of the so-called war on terror. So the further we got away from the attacks of September 11th, the more willing people actually were in some circumstances to torture somebody. So it's well, What do you think in, accounts for that? I mean, because I, I think, think we've gotten used to it. I think it's been normalized. I think the gradual drip, drip, drip of revelations has actually made torture more normal and more acceptable and more mainstream, if you will, than it was in September ele- on September 11th, and, and when you, there really was a consensus against it in this country. How, how did that process happen? I mean, is it, is it because there's this drip-drip and there's no uh, 
there's no there's no accountability. In other words, it's, exactly. it's it, so so it almost functions like um, like a uh, like a a a, 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 a strain of, of, of right. It's like an of, inoculation, a vaccine. Right. And um, this has been called by a, a theologian named William Cavanaugh. It's been called the striptease of power. And the idea is sort of now you see it, now you don't. You see these terrible pictures from Abu Ghraib, and then they sort of sink like a stone. One or two very low-level people are held accountable. Anthony Taguba publishes a report, and then the whole thing disappears. You hear a little bit about what's happened at Guantanamo. You see stories in the New York Times about stress and duress in Afghanistan, and then it disappears again. And that gradual, that gradual set of revelations actually does exactly what you say. It inoculates us. I also think that the entertainment media has a little bit of blame to bear here. You know, it was an accident that 24 happened to be scheduled for release in the fall right after September 11th. But the reality is that that show and the idea that terror, that torture is something one lone heroic operative does in moments of desperation has really seared itself into the minds of the people who have watched it. And it's a complete fabrication of what torture really is, which is an ongoing institutionalized practice that has infrastructure, trained operatives, it has uh, its own internal values, it has rituals of initiation, ways that people are brought into it, and, uh, but we've been taught that it's something heroic individuals, whether they are foreign operatives or maybe they're police in your local police station, right. are going to do to make sure that that terrible perp doesn't lawyer up. Well, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is, is that once you, once you begin to minimize, I mean, and this is all, it, it, you know, it, it functions like you, you have a, a bacterial infection, you take antibiotics, but you don't take enough. So it's almost, right. it, 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 and it basically allows the bacterial infection to sort of mutate and grow and become stronger, like a, some type of super bug. And, I mean, it, it seems like there's really only two ways you go with this, right? You completely hide the fact that torture existed, and we had, nobody ever reported it so that mm -hmm. we could keep it as something that you couldn't even talk about in public without there being serious consequences, or you actually provide the serious consequences. So right. in some respects, this let's not uh, go back, uh, you know, let's turn the page and look forward uh, is, is far more damaging than, uh, than having never known about it. Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. But, you know, I don't think that although the CIA fought the release of the report tooth and nail, and I frankly don't think that the rest of the executive branch was too thrilled about it either, the reality is that part of the work that torture and the knowledge of torture did in this country is it reminded people that we need to be terrified all the time. Because if our government, a good government, a government that's a leader in human rights in the world, is doing such terrible things, these must be really terrible people, and we must be in really terrible danger. So I don't think that the program would have been as effective in the sense of keeping everybody on board with the so-called war on terror if it had remained a secret. But you're right. Now that it's out, we do. We have superbugs. We have superbugs who are George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, people who have not and may not ever suffer any kind of, of condemnation, whether moral or legal. Now, there are a couple of possibilities here. One thing we should remember is that we need to take the long game. It's late, but the generals in Argentina are on trial right. now. Pinochet was finally brought to trial right before he died, but it did happen. And the president of Uruguay, who was tortured for 12 years, is now uh, actively working against torture and receiving people from Guantanamo who don't have anywhere else to go. So in the long run, it doesn't work. In the long run, there is a backlash. But there's another option. Well, well let me qualify that. Yeah. In the long run, if you've committed these atrocities and you are not powerful enough 
to quash investigations, let's say, that right. are taking place in Spain. Uh, exactly. And, you know, there was a judge who was, uh, who was, who was pursuing this stuff in Spain. That, that man is no yes. longer a judge. Uh, That's true. Although he, he did a lot of good before he stopped being it, a judge. But you're did. right. Uh, and, there, there, and all of the people who call this stuff out are taking terrible risks. Anthony Taguba, who wrote the report about Abu Ghraib, ended up losing his military career. You're right, that there are risks. And we, this is a time for heroism. People have to be brave about this. I also think that we could be looking for some kind of hearings to be held in Congress if, for example, John McCain, who you know, with whom I don't agree about a lot of things, but who went out front yesterday and, you know, gave a very good speech about what the CIA did was torture and it's wrong. If we could have sort of a reprise of the church hearings from 1975, are you familiar with those? Oh, yes, of course. Okay, so back in 1975, it became apparent that the CIA had actually been doing black ops inside the United States, and people were pretty outraged, and a whole series of hearings were held, and the result was that the CIA was, for some years, kind of hamstrung in what it could do. Now, it's true there were no prosecutions that came out of it, but I think that at least if we could have moral condemnation and a kind of national consensus that comes out of those kinds of hearings, and that's what happened in 75 with the church hearings. If we could have a national consensus that this was wrong and the people who were in charge of it did something terrible, that would be progress. It wouldn't be full accountability, but it would be at least a, an official level, an official imprimatur on on. That something that was wrong. This was wrong. Yeah, and, but and, this was wrong. And and I, you know, I am I am very skeptical. I think uh, you know we may hear another couple of things out of McCain, but frankly, I'm not I'm not convinced we're going to hear much more. What what it raises also what I find most interesting about um, <clears throat> Anthony Romero, the the head mm -hmm. of the ACLU's uh, op-ed the other day, saying that we should. We should pardon all involved. He's getting a lot of criticism yes, for people who, who are saying that that is uh, that, that that lets people off the hook. But the thing that is interesting to me is is that once you have that debate, if two people debate as to whether or not there should be a pardon, it seems to me both people are acknowledging that a crime has been committed. Yes, and and, yes. and to that extent, from a political perspective, maybe it's not the maybe the ACLU is not the best uh, voice for something like that. But that seems seems to me to be at least moving down that road where we acknowledge, hey, the law was broken. This stuff is wrong. You need a pardon if you're going to be free. Yes. I, I, you know, I thought it was a very imaginative move, and I agree that perhaps the ACLU isn't, isn't going to be able to carry that as well as some other, you know, some other maybe more mainstream organization. But on the other hand, I, I consider the ACLU fairly mainstream, and I think they do really good and important work. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually, my, my feeling was that the ACLU should not place themselves in a position of, I, I see that as a bit of a capitulation. I wasn't suggesting that they weren't uh, mainstream enough to carry the message, but right. rather it may hurt their brand, frankly. Right, uh, exactly. Because no, I think that's right. I think that they're, get, they're getting a lot of flack. But, but I think that he has actually started a conversation that I'm not quite sure how else we could have gotten it started I about agree. the fact that crimes actually have been committed and whether or not the idea is actually taken up. The very fact of having put it out there, I think, was actually pretty smart. Yes. I, I, like I say, if, if two people are debating whether or not there should be a pardon, they are necessarily accepting the premise that a crime has been committed. Exactly. And that, I think, is, uh, is, is crucial. Uh, I mean, so... So where do we go from here? I mean, uh, assuming we're not going to have another round of church hearings, which I don't believe that we will, if, if, if we only do. because of the culpability. I mean, look, uh, John Brennan, who's not exactly in the center of this, uh, of, of what went on, uh, certainly, you know, had a front row seat. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the torture, and, and arguably maybe a, a closer one. Uh, and in fact, yesterday, his statement was, hey, it worked. Right. I mean, yes, the CIA is going to continue to, to, uh, to, to do that. So where, where else could this come from? I mean, where else, how do we not get worse from here? 
I think that's a really important question, and I wish I could tell you that I have all the answers to that. But I think that part of the job of people in the media is to keep the question live as much as we can. And that means more imaginative, imaginative interventions like what Anthony Romero did and more, you know, I, I've spent many, many years telling people, call Congress, write letters to Congress. I did it during the Contra War. I did it. I've done it over and over. And the truth is, I know that those things, when they have an effect, they happen very slowly. There are organizations that are doing work um, on Capitol Hill in the background that are doing lobbying, that are working with members of Congress who might be, you know, encouraged to take some kind of action. But, you know, there are a couple of demands that we could make. One is to pass the federal law outlawing torture. And that's a possibility that could come out of this. John McCain's not going to hold hearings, but he might be persuaded to pass, you know, to carry a, a law that just makes torture. Right, illegal. or at least to offer a bill. Or offer a bill, even offer a bill, which causes, you know, some conversation. And, you know, he's very well placed to do it because he's a Republican. We've got a Republican Congress coming in. So that's one thing that I think is that really could be done. Another thing we could do is we could look at torture in another place where it's hidden in plain sight and where the numbers involved are actually much, much larger than the war on terror. And that's in the prisons prisons. here in the United States. You know, we've got somewhere between 50 and 80,000 people in solitary confinement in this country. And we now know that within two weeks, people begin to experience psychosis. They get hallucinations. They become deeply paranoid. They hear voices. There are people in my state, California, who have been in solitary for almost three decades. Wow. And, that, and that's not the only form of torture that goes on in an institutionalized, regular way in prison. The other one is rape and sexual abuse, which is so rampant that um, many reports have been written by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. But it's so rampant that it's a plot device on your average right, right. evening entertainment. I, I want to. I want to go back. I mean, I think one other thing that uh, you know, in in a sort of a more fantastical, uh, in a parallel universe, uh, yes. we would scrap the CIA, and that would well, also yes. provide. That would be a good move. Uh, be, it would be much harder for people in the future to go along with these programs if they believed that they could actually uh, get some accountability in that regard. But let me let me let me go back to just sort of the the sort of the broader cultural implications. Mm-hmm. When was it? I mean, was it always the case that, uh, in this country anyways, there was a sense that torture was wrong? In other no, words, yeah, it wasn't always the case. There's always been one group of people who were legitimate targets of torture. And I hate to say it, but it's true, and it's African Americans. And that goes back to the very beginning of slavery, It was always okay and, in fact, necessary to torture slaves to get them to work. And then we see the same kind of thing in lynchings in the 20th century. So the consensus, but there was a consensus that most people people should not be tortured. And part of what happened, again, around the time of the late 70s is that information about what happened in Vietnam about the Phoenix program in which some 30,000 people were tortured. They called it pump and dump. They supposedly pumped them for information and then dumped them into the South China Sea. And when that information began to seep into the U.S., there really was a public revulsion. And so for a good 30, 25, 30 years, there was a consensus that we don't do this. This is wrong. The first break in it that I saw was actually November 5th of 2001 when Jonathan Alter, who is a liberal journalist and historian, wrote a piece that appeared in Newsweek called Time to Think About Torture. Right. do you remember that? I do what? remember. In fact, I have it in my uh, stack here of yeah. uh, uh, of, ma- of material. Uh, it was uh, Jim Rutenberg qu- uh, quoted, actually wrote a piece about it um, in in two thousand one, November five. Uh, mm-hmm. And apparently, Alter wrote uh, in this autumn of anger, even a liberal can find his thoughts turning to torture. Exactly. Uh, and uh, something to jumpstart the stalled investigation of the greatest crime in American history. 
there was a lot of other uh, liberals, I think, at that time, too. Uh, and even someone, you know, uh, I don't know where Alan Dershowitz fits on that spectrum oh. these days. Well, um, he, had, he had actually already been talking about torture warrants for a long time because that's his particular hobby horse. Right. That we're going to torture people. They do it in Israel. We should do it here. And if we're going to do it, it should be done decently and in order with a warrant. Um, that's been his. But, you know, he just... He, well, it's fascinating I, that the 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 change in um, in the perspective on torture came from, in one instance, a change in the perspective of the people we were torturing uh, in terms right. of slaves, right. and then secondarily in something that was so massive and part of a um, a greater pushback against that uh, the the Vietnam War. I, I'm just you know it, it, in. This new context where we are waging uh, a, a sort of an ongoing secret war that has very little cost to the United States, at least in terms of uh, your average citizen being, being aware of it, frankly. Um, uh, it, it seems to me that this, the, you know, this, this sense of torture is okay is going to metastasize unless, uh, unless there's something uh, dramatic that takes place, and I just don't see it. I'm afraid that you may be right about that, and I, I, but you know, hope is right. an important virtue, <laughs> and I think that although it's hard to see it right now, I also want to point out that sometimes things happen that we don't expect. Nobody really expected the Soviet Union to collapse after 70 years, and very suddenly it fell in on itself. So I'm not going to rule out the possibility that something happens which changes this momentum. But I do think that we need to be doing the kind of work that you're doing, that I'm doing, that other people are doing to remind people that torture is wrong. And one of the ways we might be able to do that, frankly, because Americans care more about Americans, is to piggyback on a momentum that is growing in this country which is a kind of revulsion at the mass incarceration that's happening in this country. There's actually a big momentum right now to end solitary confinement and to end the death penalty. And it's, it's moving across states. And it's interesting because it's kind of at, at cross purposes, if you will, with this other accommodation to torture that we're seeing in, in the society. But, you know, whoever said we were consistent. Yeah, and right. I think that if we can take that, if we can seize that momentum and find a way to say, you know, if we can't, if we're not going to do this to Americans, we also shouldn't do it to other people and to, to move that. It's, you know, I'm sort of a political um, expediency person. I see kind of the waves that are moving and say, okay, we need to ride this one. So in, with my concern about torture, I think the wave that's moving at the moment actually has to do with torture in U.S. prisons. Yes, I think you're right about that. It's it's one of the few places in society where we see anything that is sort of like trans-ideological uh, right. in, in terms of any type of at least policy momentum. Rebecca Gordon, author of Mainstreaming Torture, Ethical Approaches in the Post-9-11 United States. Uh, we will link to it at majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. 